Welcome to Hope Church Online. I am Jason, and I am so glad that you are here. Today we are in part two of our series, A Christmas Story. And we're going to look at how God is at work in some of the ordinary events at life that look kind of random to us. You're going to be glad you're here today. Hey, we're going to get started in 60 seconds. So in the chat, tell us something. What's your favorite Christmas movie? And keep it nice. See you in a minute.
This is the story of Ruth, chapter 2. When Ruth and Naomi arrived in Bethlehem, they were very, very poor. And it was the busiest time of year, harvest time. Ruth wanted to take good care of Naomi, so she told her, I'll go into the fields and gather the leftover grain for us to eat. It was very hard work, and Ruth did this every day. Naomi was too old to gather food for herself, so she was very thankful for Ruth's help. God was watching over Ruth and Naomi, and someone God sent to help was also looking out for Ruth and Naomi. A good man named Boaz owned the fields where Ruth went to pick grain. One day, Boaz saw Ruth in the fields, so he asked his workers, who is she? They replied, she came here with Naomi. She asked if she could pick grain that was left behind. She works hard all day long. Boaz was impressed with Ruth and very kind to her. One day he went to her and said, you can take as much grain as you want from my fields. When you get hungry or thirsty, come to share my food and water. Naomi was so grateful when Ruth would come home with food. She asked, who is helping you with all of this? Ruth told her, a man named Boaz. Boaz, Naomi said, he is my relative and a very good man. Keep working there and you will be safe. So Ruth kept working there. Before long, Boaz fell in love with Ruth. The story of Ruth is such a beautiful piece of literature. Even stylistically, it's been noted by several authors and historians how beautiful the story is in its symmetry and in its structure. It's a beautiful love story about a man and a woman who seem to be made for each other and destined for each other, but there's always something keeping them apart, and can they get together by the end of the story? It's a story about life, about disappointment and hope, about desperation and optimism, about death and birth. But ultimately, the story of Ruth is a story of redemption. And that's something that we can all relate to, or at least in our hearts we long to. But it's not the story of Ruth's redemption. What's interesting is while we named the story after Ruth, it's actually the story of Naomi and how Naomi experienced redemption in her life. In case you missed last week, here's how the story got started in chapter 1. Naomi was married to Elimelech. Now, this couple appears to be a godly couple because in Hebrew, the name Elimelech means God is my king. And the name Naomi means pleasant. So you've got this couple, seem like a wonderful, godly couple, and they live in the town of Bethlehem. It was a little town, and it would lie very still. But it was the time of the judges, which was a time of upheaval and godlessness in the land of Israel, and it was compounded, the problem was, when there was a famine in the region of Bethlehem. So Elimelech and Naomi decided, we heard there's rain, we heard there's food in Moab. So they take their two sons and they move to a nearby country and they settle there. And that's when tragedy strikes. Elimelech dies of unknown causes, we're not told why, and their two sons, they married Moabite women. Now, Moabite women had kind of a reputation when it came to God's people, the, the Hebrews. But they seem to have done pretty well. They married two fine young women, but then the two boys also died. And Naomi's life has come crashing down on her. Her husband died, and she's a widow. Her two boys died. She has no descendants. She is left alone and destitute. Well, over the course of 10 years, she hears that the famine has lifted in Bethlehem. There's nothing left for her in Moab. So she decides, I'm going to go back home. I'm going to go back to Bethlehem. And she tells her two daughters-in-law, Orpah and Ruth, Girls, you've been wonderful. You were wonderful wives for my boys, but it's time for me to go home. You should stay here with your people. Go back to your own parents' homes. Maybe you'll find a new husband and settle down. May God bless you with the rest of your lives. And she turns to leave. And Orpah, in bitterness of tears, she listens because Naomi's counsel is wise. She has no future with Naomi. If she wants any chance of a future, she should stay there in Moab while Naomi leaves. But 
Ruth sees it differently. And Ruth clings to Naomi. And she says, I'm going with you. Nothing will separate me from you. And the reason why, Ruth said, that we saw last week, is because Naomi worships the Lord. And in coming to know her, Ruth also came to know the Lord, and she made a choice. I don't want to be with my people anymore. I want to be with the Lord's people. So I want to be where Naomi lives. And she was willing to leave her culture, her language, her people, her family, to go and be with the Lord's people. And this already says something very powerful about Ruth, and it says something powerful about our reality. We all have a family by blood, and maybe this year with your holidays, you're really sad, you're really disappointed that you can't be with them, but Ruth teaches us that you have a stronger family connection. It's your family through the blood of Jesus, that we can be brothers and sisters, sons and daughters of God, and there is a powerful bond connected in that. And Ruth lives that out in her life, so she travels back to Bethlehem with Naomi. And when they get there, all the people from Bethlehem, they see Naomi, and they're whispering among one another, and they say, is that Naomi? Is she really back? And she says, don't call me Naomi anymore, because that name means pleasant. Call me Mara. That name means bitter, because I left full, but the Lord has brought me back empty. And that's the end of chapter one. And with that, the stage is set for the rest of the book. What will happen with Naomi? Will she experience redemption or will her life end in this bitter disappointment? Well, that's where we pick up chapter two. And as we get started, there's a big idea that I want you to focus on today. There's a major theme that we see throughout this entire chapter and really throughout the entire book of Ruth. And that is this. In the ordinary events of life, in the ordinary events of everyday life, in our ups, in our downs, in our triumphs, in our tragedies, in the ordinariness of life, God is at work to do extraordinary things. Even in the downs, even in the frustrations, even in the sorrows, God is at work to do extraordinary things for His glory, and for your good. That's what we see in this chapter. Now, one of the things that I personally love about the story of Ruth is as you read it from beginning to end, God is silent. God does not speak. Uh, He's not even mentioned by the narrator as someone who's active in this story. Yet, as the story progresses, what we see is that in these ordinary events of life, even in the tragedy that that Naomi has suffered, that Ruth has suffered, God is going to do extraordinary things. And what the narrator shows us is that oftentimes life is like looking at the bottom of a tapestry. It looks like a chaotic mess. But if you can get to the top of the loom and look at it, what you see is something beautiful. And this is a chapter where the narrator starts to give us some of that perspective. And the reason why that's helpful is because many of us are going through challenging times. Many of us are going through difficult times, like Naomi, like Ruth. And what we see in this chapter is that God is often doing His most extraordinary work, not through miracles, not through divine intervention, but He's quietly at work in the ordinary events of life. And that's an idea that we call providence, that God is at work in everyday life, in ordinary means, to do extraordinary things. So today we're going to read chapter 2. If you want, you can grab your Bibles or open a Bible app and follow along that way. We're just going to read right through the text and unpack it as we go through it. And as we do, we're going to see God at work in ordinary ways. Now, as the chapter begins, Ruth and Naomi are desperate for two things. Number one, they're desperate for food. And number two, they're desperate for family. So they come back penniless, empty, broken. Now, there is the ancestral land which belonged to Elimelech. And now Naomi and Ruth can live there. So they have a place to live, but they don't have food. And they don't have a family, namely the ability to have children and carry on the family line and pass down the land as an inheritance. Those are the two challenges that they face. Today, we're going to see how one of those problems is met. Ruth chapter 2, verse 1. Now, this is a parenthetical note from the narrator. It's not part of the story. Now, Naomi had a relative on her husband's side. This is not her relative. It was Elimelech's relative. A man of standing from the clan of Elimelech, whose name was 
Boaz. Now, when it says it was a man of standing, that could refer to a number of things. It could mean he was wealthy. It could mean that he was an important person in the town. It could mean that he's just a good and godly man. And in the case of Boaz, it certainly seems to be all three of these. And Boaz was from the same clan as Elimelech. Now, in those days, an individual was part of a family. You had your family. And a group of families that were descended from the same ancestor made up a clan. Now, a group of clans made up a tribe, and the nation of Israel was made up of 12 tribes. So this was an immediate family, probably wasn't even a first or second cousin, but part of the same clan. There was definitely a connection between Elimelech and Boaz. Verse 2, And Ruth, the Moabite, and the narrator just reminds us she is not a Hebrew, she is an outsider, said to Naomi, Let me go to the fields and pick up the leftover grain behind anyone in whose eyes I find favor. Naomi said to her, Go ahead, my daughter. Now, what this is referring to is a custom that took place in ancient Israel that was called gleaning. And here's how it worked. God, in His Old Testament covenant with His people, wanted to make sure that the marginalized of society would have a way to survive. So this would be the widowed, the orphans, and immigrants who could not find work. They had practices like gleaning so they could survive. Here's how it worked. Uh, When it was harvest season, uh, some of these poor, these marginalized people, they could go to somebody's field and ask permission and go behind the harvesters and pick up whatever it was that they missed, and they could have it and take it home with them. Now, what God told the landowners in His covenant was, I don't want you to be stingy. I want you to be generous because that land you're farming is my land. Your name's on the title, but it's not going to be on the title very long because you'll be dead and someone else's name will be on the title. That is my land. You are the caretaker. And because it's my land, I want to make sure that all people are provided for. So don't harvest all the way to the edge of your property. Leave some slack so people who need help, who are destitute, they can come and they can find uh, providence. They can find food to eat. And when your harvesters bundle up into sheaves, be a little sloppy with your work. Make sure there's some leftovers so they can come and pick it up off the ground, and that way they won't starve. So this would kind of be like, I don't know, when I was a kid, someone picking up aluminum cans on the side of the road to recycle them to try and make a little bit of money to survive. That's kind of the cultural equivalent. Verse 3, So she went out, entered a field, and began to glean behind the harvesters. As it turned out, pause, as it turned out, which is the narrator's way of saying, wouldn't you know it, it just so happened. Now, the title of today's message that I'm bringing you is, It Just So Happened. Write that in the chat. It just so happened. Events that look random in life, it just so happened, wouldn't you know it, come together to do something extraordinary in our lives. Now, if you think back on your life, you can probably think of some it just so happened kind of events. Uh, I can think of one from my life. When I was a senior in college and I played on the soccer team, one beautiful Saturday in, in September, uh, we finished our home game. We were on campus and it just so happened we won the game that Saturday. And I was feeling pretty confident. So when I strolled over to the football game, which just so happened to also have a home game that day, I saw that in the grassy bowl around the end zone, there is a beautiful young barefoot girl seated on a blanket all by herself. And I just so happened to notice her. And I thought to myself, she's cute. And because I was feeling confident, I went over to her and say, hey, is anybody sitting there? And she just so happened to say, no, you can sit there. And by the end of the game, I worked up the nerve to ask her out that night, and it just so happened that she had other plans. But it just so happened that a couple of days later, she was free, and Kathy and I started dating. But you've got your own stories about life, where things that look random, things that look like chance, we look at them and say, it just so happened, wouldn't you know it? What the narrator is going to show us is how often God is using those just So happened events to do some of his greatest work in your life. So the story goes like this. As it turned out, she was working in a field belonging to Boaz, and in case you have the attention span of a goldfish, who was from the clan of 
Elimelech. Wouldn't you know it, of all the fields she could have wandered into to glean in, she happened to walk into the field of Boaz. To paraphrase Humphrey Bogart, of all the fields and all the towns and all the world, she happens to walk into mine. Wouldn't you know it? Now, the narrator is talking this way to clue us into the fact that God is doing something profound here, and he wants these two to somehow connect and get together. Because every good and perfect gift is from above, and that is how God often works in his providence. You know, I think of another example when it comes to providence and how God works in the extraordinary events of life. I think of our building that we're constructing right now, Hope Church. What you might not realize is we have been working at this for five years. And before we got to our current property, we tried to rezone and buy two other properties. And twice we got shot down by the local municipality where those properties were located and we were hitting our heads against the wall. Not only that, there were two other buildings that we wanted to buy and renovate for a church. And both of those derailed before we could even get to the local municipalities to rezone them and use them for a church. And all the while, with all that frustration, I thought to myself, I know God is doing something in this. I know there's a reason behind it, but I can't see it. I can just see the bottom of the loom and it all looks random and it all looks like a mess and I don't see where any of this is going. But it just so happened that after door after door after door closed, this one finally opened. And it just so happened that when we were planning on breaking ground in March, a pandemic broke out and it just so happened that we had to delay And it just so happens that now that we've broken ground, when we take occupancy of the building, which should happen sometime in the neighborhood of Labor Day next year, that vaccinations will have been made available for all Americans by that time. And it just so happens that life will be getting back to normal when we're moving in to our new building and we can go forward full speed ahead with the mission God has given this church. And I can just see it in front of us, all of the lives and eternities that God wants to change. And all of it along the way just so happened. God's providence is almost impossible to see while it's happening. But when you look around and pay attention, and especially when you look back, you can start to see what God has been up to the whole time. Now, that's just a couple of stories for me. I want to share an even better story of God's providence with you. And it's about two people at Hope Church. Let's take a look. My name is Doug Kelsey. I am retired, retired military. I spent 20 years in the United States Navy. I've been retired for 40 years, so I uh, currently live in Sun City, Arizona. I lived in Escanaba, Michigan. And I graduated from high school and came down to Milwaukee and we had a lot of agonizing as to what to do. I mean, you know, Barb's pregnant uh, and she knew of this program the Lutheran Church had in Milwaukee for unwed mothers. So we decided that was the way to go. And what they did back then, Barb went to work in a, a doctor's home doing light housekeeping and they had some children, so nanny worked until the baby was born and then and then she was put up for adoption. So I knew I knew when she was born, but after that I no idea. I'm Julie Dodge and uh, have always lived here in southeastern Wisconsin, Milwaukee. We, my husband Larry and I have lived out here in Economwalk since eighty six. Um, so Lake Country is home for us and and of course hope is our home. I was um, three months old when my mom and dad adopted me and um, you know never really had a desire to to search for my birth parents at all. When they put me up for adoption to me that's an act of love that that you do for for a baby and so I had thought about it occasionally but put it off for years and years. Larry and Larry's always been more curious than I have and he bought me the Ancestry DNA kit for Mother's Day last year. And, and you know, I was real open to it and ready at this point. Um, I had bucked against it for years, 
and it just seemed like the natural thing to do. Initially, I had contacts from it was cousins on my mother's side of the family, and and they knew the history be, between my birth mom and dad, and so they were able to point me in his direction, and so I knew where he was, I knew where he lived, and I knew the backstory, and then all of a sudden one day I looked and I had a, a young man pop up as a match, and it was like nephew or closer as far as the degree of connection, and so it's like okay this is. This is it, and I reached out, and, and he got us in touch. Then my son called me and said, I said, yeah, okay. <laughs> <laughs> it was, uh, every, everything clicked, and uh, mm -hmm. Julie included a uh, telephone number in case somebody wanted to call. I had just been sitting there trying to compose an email to send to him to introduce myself via email. And you think, oh, should I write this or should I write that? Or, you know, well, if I say this and, and then all of a sudden the phone rings and it's like, yay, I don't have to do the email. <laughs> yes. We said hello. Yeah. And, it, it, it was... and the conversation just flowed. And I think we even talked, I don't know, a long yeah. time that first conversation, um, found out we had read the same trilogy of books. Um, like the same reading material and yeah, we have a and things. Tremendous amount of stuff in common. Some good, some bad, but it's all yeah. that makes us the people we are. Yes. <laughs> well, here we are, and I mean, it's it's been very easy. It's like we, for me, like we've known each other forever, even mm -hmm. though our physical relationship has been much less. But uh, it's been a, it's been a gratify and I've got to get a plug in for Larry <laughs> we are we have a great relationship it's just this whole thing has been has been great yeah if I would if I would have known it was that easy I probably would have done it a lot sooner I wish you would have <laughs> yeah, yeah. so do I <laughs> um, dad came up for my birthday in January it's January 12th 2020 Julie and Larry asked me if I'd like to go to church with them. And and normally I would have said, mm, that's okay, you guys go ahead and I'll, when you come home, be all right. And I, I said, okay. And I actually found myself singing. I have not been involved in church for 60 years. And uh, this is just, I'm on kind of a new journey. And this is, this is part of it. And, to see where it goes. I'm, I've got a ways to go, probably a long ways to go, but I, I really feel that my heart is in a good place. But my my attitude's changing. I, I, I think I'm a better person. Still got a long ways to go, but, but I'm, we're working on it. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and Hope Church is, is helping me too, so. I can't imagine not having him in my life at this point. And it's it's only been just over a year. So it, we've, it's, like it, I said, we have been truly blessed in this relationship. My name is Doug, and this is my daughter, Julie. And I'm Julie, and this is my dad, Doug. It just so happened that Julie was finally ready to take that DNA test. And it just so happened that after all those decades, a father and daughter met for the first time. And it just so happened that while he would normally decline an invitation to church, this time he felt like he would take him up on that offer. And it just so happened in all of these circumstances over all of these decades, that a man came to church and was reintroduced to Jesus and united with him. And all the while, through all those decades, it looked like the ordinary events of life. But God wants to use the ordinary events of life to do some of his most breathtaking work. It just so happened. God's providence is a beautiful thing, church. And you don't want to miss it because it is so easy to overlook because it hides in plain sight. Well, 
Ruth just so happens to walk into the field that Boaz owns, and he notices. Verse 4, just then, <laughs> it just so happens. Just then, Boaz arrived from Bethlehem and greeted the harvesters. The Lord be with you. The Lord bless you, they answered. Now, that's fascinating to me because Boaz shows up and talks to his blue-collar guys. Hey, the Lord bless you guys. And they're like, hey, you too. The Lord bless you. This is like your job, isn't it? CEO walks in, gives a priestly blessing over all the employees. You pop your head out of your cubicle like a groundhog. The Lord bless you too, Mr. CEO. And then you go back to work. No, not your work. Well, anyway, that's how Boaz ran his business. He's a remarkable man of faith. Verse 5, Boaz asked the overseer of his harvesters, who does that young woman belong to? So Boaz looks, he's an attentive guy, and he sees this woman, this young woman out working, gleaning in his field, and he doesn't know who she is. He's like, what family is she from? What clan is she from? I don't recognize her. The overseer replied, she is the Moabite who came back from Moab with Naomi. She said, please let me glean and gather among the sheaves behind the harvesters. She came into the field and has remained here from morning till now, except for a short rest in the shelter. Now, quick question. How does Ruth look as she's been working, harvesting, gleaning in the field all morning long, and it's hot, and she's been working hard? She took a short rest, and now she's back at it. Ladies, how does she look? Probably sweaty, hair in a ponytail, looks nasty, doesn't smell good. But Boaz takes notice of her. Boaz takes notice about her and ultimately is attracted to her, not because of what she looks like. In fact, we have no idea what Ruth looks like. We are never given any hint about her physical appearance. What draws his attention is her character, her values. And in that, there is something to pay attention to, especially if you're single. If you're a gal and you're single and you're saying, there are no good guys to date anymore then the way to attract a good guy is the way that Ruth attracted a good guy. She attracted him through her character. And the more you focus on godly character, the more likely you are to attract a good and godly man. Guys, same is true for you. If if you want to meet a, a great and godly girl, then have great and godly character. Focus not on finding the right person as much as you're focusing on becoming the kind of person that the kind of person you're looking for would look for. That's who Ruth is. She, she's a godly woman, a hard worker, good character, and Boaz wants to meet her, verse 8. So Boaz said to Ruth, just walks right over to her, My daughter, listen to me. Don't go and glean in another field, and don't go away from here. How's that for an Old Testament pickup line? Don't glean anywhere else. You can glean right here in my field. Uh, stay here with the women who work for me. Watch the field where the men are harvesting, and follow along after the women. I have told the men not to lay a hand on you, which I think is the first sexual harassment policy in recorded literature. And whenever you are thirsty, go and get a drink from the water jars that the men have filled. Now, what's Boaz doing? He's providing community. He's providing protection. He's providing safety. Boaz goes to her and he gives her this safe place to be. Even though she's an outsider, even though she's a woman, even though she's a foreigner, he welcomes her in and treats her with dignity and kindness. And what's interesting is he uses the same language that Ruth used in chapter 1. In chapter 1, Ruth said to Naomi, I will cling to you. I'm not going anywhere. Now Boaz uses that language to Ruth. You can cling to this field. Don't go anywhere. Be tied to it. Be loyal to it. I will be loyal to you. At this, she bowed down with her face to the ground. She asked him, Why have I found such favor in your eyes that you would notice me, a foreigner? Now, this is mercy beyond anything she anticipated that morning. All she hoped that morning was that she could find enough favor to quietly go about her work, pick up some scraps of barley, and go home so that her and Naomi might have food for a couple of days. She's genuinely floored that this man of standing would be kind to her, go out of his way to say, hey, I want to look after you. You're going to be safe here. You stay here for the entire harvest, which was about a six-week part-time job. Boaz replied, I've been told 
all about what you have done for your mother-in-law since the death of your husband, how you left your father and mother and your homeland and have come to live with the people you did not know. So Boaz says, I've heard about your character. I've heard about the kind of person you are. And now he prays over her. May the Lord repay you for what you have done. May you be richly rewarded by the Lord, the God of Israel, under whose wings you have come to take refuge. Now, here's what's interesting. Spoiler alert. Every single prayer that is prayed in the book of Ruth is answered by the end of the story. And Boaz prays these two prayers over Ruth. May the Lord repay you. May you be richly rewarded because you have come to take shelter underneath his wings. Now, here's what's interesting. God will answer the prayer of Boaz, and who will God use to answer the prayer of Boaz? He's going to use Boaz. You see, sometimes when we pray, it moves the heart of God to intervene and act on our behalf, and sometimes when we pray, it moves our hearts to start aligning our behavior and our actions and our words more closely with God's heart. So Boaz hears about this woman, her goodness, her godliness. He prays for her, and by the end of the story, God answers his prayer by using him. Verse 13, May I continue to find favor in your eyes, my Lord, she said. You have put me at ease by speaking kindly to your servant. Remember that word, kindly. Though I do not have the standing of one of your servants. So she's genuinely honored by him. She's at the lowest rung of this social ladder, but he has gone out of his way to treat her kindly. Now, that's their first meeting. It's still mid-morning. She goes back to work, and he goes back to being the CEO and overseeing uh, this harvest operation. But here's what happens at verse 14. At mealtime, Boaz said to her, come over here, have some bread, and dip it in the wine vinegar. When she sat down with the harvesters, he offered her some roasted grain. She ate all she wanted and had some left over. So uh, here's their first date. He takes her out to lunch at the Roasted Grain Cafe. He says, hey, I noticed you don't have any lunch today. You came empty-handed. Why don't you come over here? You can have lunch with her. Now, that already would be a gracious enough gesture, but here's what's fascinating about Boaz. He serves her. Now, normally in that culture, he could invite her to lunch. She should serve him lunch. Or if he really wanted to be generous, he could have another worker serve the both of them. But he, the boss, the landowner, the CEO, he personally decides, I'm going to serve you from my table. I'm going to be gracious to you and elevate you. I'm going to use my position of honor and strength to elevate and dignify you. Verse 15, as she got up to glean, so lunch is over, Boaz gave orders to his men. Let her gather among the sheaves and don't reprimand her. Even pull out some stalks for her from the bundles and leave them for her to pick up and don't rebuke her. So again, Ruth is an outsider. What does Boaz do? He makes her an insider. She is the lowest on the rung. What does he do? He elevates her so that she's treated better than he is. She's a foreigner, but he gives her belonging in a place among the people. And he even tells the workers, okay, guys, she's a foreigner. We get it. But I don't want to hear any jokes about how many Moabites does it take to change an oil lamp. None of that. Treat her with dignity. Help her out. Don't rebuke her. Go out of your way to be kind to her. Verse 17. So Ruth gleaned in the field until evening. Then she threshed the barley she had gathered, and it amounted, check this out, to about an ephah. Okay, let me help you. An ephah, according to the ancient Hebrew system of weights and measurements, it was about a tenth of a homer. Okay, let me help you out. Uh, When we translate into an American system of weights and measures, that's about two-thirds of a bushel. Okay, let me help you out. That's about 40 or 50 pounds of barley. Now, in those days, the rations for a a working laborer was about one to two pounds. She goes out, and in the course of a day, she gets food for a month. That's an incredible day of picking up cans on the side of the road. And uh, 
this is how we know Ruth was in CrossFit. She carried it back to town, and her mother-in-law saw how much she had gathered. Ruth also brought out and gave her what she had left over after she had eaten enough. Her mother-in-law said, where did you glean today? Where did you work? Blessed be the man who took notice of you. So she says, hey, Naomi, I'm home. Earned about 1,200 bucks picking up cans on the side of the road today. Oh, and my new boss took me out for lunch. Here's the doggy bag. Now, what's interesting is as you read this, the narrator is showing us that for the first time in a long time, Naomi's excited about something. Notice how her words come spilling out. Where did you work today? Where were you? Who did this for you? Blessed be the person. Jesus all of a sudden excited and as her words pick up and come spilling out. Verse 19, Then Ruth told her mother-in-law about the one at whose place she had been working. The name of the man I worked with today is Boaz, she said. The Lord bless him, Naomi said to her daughter-in-law. He has not stopped showing his kindness to the living and the dead. Now, what's interesting is who has not stopped showing kindness, Boaz or the Lord? The narrator leaves it ambiguous. We're not sure who she's talking about, but it's both. She added, that man is our close relative. He is one of our guardian redeemers. Now, In these two verses, we have the two main themes of the book of Ruth brought together. The one is kindness, and the other is redemption. He has kindness, so Boaz has kindness, and he is a guardian redeemer within their clan. Now, the redemption part, the guardian redeemer part, you're going to have to come back for the next two weeks to hear about that major theme. But today, in a few minutes, we're going to look at the other major theme, which is kindness. Then Ruth the Moabite said, He even said to me, Stay with my workers until they finish harvesting all my grain. Naomi said to Ruth, her daughter-in-law, It will be good for you, my daughter, to go with the women who work for him, because in someone else's field you might be harmed. So Ruth stayed close to the woman, the women of Boaz to glean until the barley and the wheat harvest were finished, and she lived with her mother-in-law. Now, again, the harvest season was about six weeks long, which means their first problem has been addressed. They have food. And after one day, they had a month's worth of food. She can be there in his fields for the next about six weeks. So their food problem is solved, but they still have the problem of family. What will they do about that problem? And again, we'll pick up on that theme next week. But today, for the balance of our time, I want to talk about the prominent theme in chapter 2, and that is kindness, how we see kindness in the demeanor of Ruth, but more importantly, in the character and quality of Boaz. Kindness, the Hebrew word, there's no real English equivalent for what that word means. I mean, kindness is our best stab at it, but there's no one word that captures everything the Hebrew word and context and culture communicate. It's a word that communicated kindness, mercy, generosity, selfless love, tenderness. It was all of these virtues coming together in one powerful word. Some some translations translated as loving kindness, um, but it's, it's this powerful word of all these great virtues, and we see it exemplified over and over in the story of Boaz and in the story of Ruth. Now, in this chapter, we have Ruth, who the author repeatedly tells us is a Moabite. She's not one of God's people. She's a foreigner. She's not a man. She's a woman. She's not an insider. She's an outsider. And then we have Boaz, who comes and shows her extravagant kindness. So what's the point of this chapter? It's not simply that we look to Boaz and say, what a good example of what it means to be a godly man. It's certainly not less than that. He's a remarkable example of what it means to be a godly man. But there's something else here in this story. There's there's something else that we're supposed to see because Boaz is pointing to someone else. Every single one of us, to some degree, knows tragedy and pain and suffering just like Ruth did. It's part of this broken world we live in. Yet, in God's providence, she found a man who was kind, who was caring, who was generous, who didn't treat her by her labels, 
who didn't treat her by her status in society, who didn't treat her the way everyone else would treat her, but looked at her and crossed all lines to bring her in and give her a sense of community and belonging and affirmation. Boaz, the Lord of the harvest, shows his kindness to this Moabite woman who's been widowed. And in this, what we see is someone to whom Boaz points, and that is to Jesus. Jesus, who looks at us in our sin and brokenness as outsiders with God's people, not insiders, as as foreigners from God's people who don't deserve to be included among them, but he reaches across every single line. He comes from heaven to earth. He comes from the holiness of God to a sinful people to live among us. And then the Lord of the harvest, Jesus himself, delighted to serve you and humble himself so he could elevate you. And he humbled himself all the way to the point of death, even death on the cross. And on the third day, he rose again, victorious over death, so that through his standing, he could redeem you and show you his kindness and give you a place in God's family as his son or as his daughter, because that's who Jesus is. Jesus is the true Lord of the harvest who showed his loving kindness to us. And God is a God who serves the hurting. God is a God who brings you in and gives you a place of belonging at his table. And this is the same loving kindness that in the town of Bethlehem, some 1,200 years after Boaz lived, we would see in Jesus, who was born outside of the town of Bethlehem in a field in a manger, and his kindness was revealed to the world. And that's the first thing that makes this a Christmas story, but we're going to learn more about that over the next couple of weeks. There's one more thing I I want to draw your attention to in chapter 2, and that's the providence of God. When you're in a season where life isn't working out, and when you're in a season of tragedy or pain or suffering, we, we look at Boaz being kind to Ruth and say, well, that's wonderful, but it doesn't really work that way in real life. Here's what you need to remember. Years have transpired since the story began that we started reading last week. Naomi's life and the pain that happened unfolded over a decade in Moab. What we read in the course of 15 seconds in three verses, that was a decade of her life slowly unrolling into tragedy. And then they make the long journey back to Bethlehem, and then they have this six-month harvest season that's starting, and their life is moving at normal life speed. We're just getting the highlights of the story, but that's what we need to remember. We're not feeling the agony and the misery of every day in Naomi's life, but you're feeling it in your life. You're feeling your concerns, your worries, your stresses, your anxieties, your pain, your grief, and your loss. But you know what God does? He works through the ordinary. He works through all things that happen. And He bends them into His will and His plan and His purpose to do extraordinary things in your life. That's the hope we have in reading Ruth chapter 2. How can we know? Because Jesus, the true Lord of the harvest, used all of these events from the past to lead up to His birth at Christmas and His death and resurrection on Easter so that we could be brought in and be made children of God. And that's what gives us a certain hope that God is kind. And in His kindness, He will exalt you in glory forever. And we'll pick up the story there next week. Let's pray. Father, it is almost impossible for us to see Your providence in real time. I ask that we will have eyes to see how, as we look back at our own lives and at our own stories, we'll see how you have been at work to do extraordinary things that on the surface, it looks like it just so happened that way. Thank you for letting us see it in the story of Ruth and Naomi and Boaz, and thank you that this points us ahead to the Christmas story. 
where Jesus, you humbled yourself to elevate and exalt us. And because you were willing to do that, give us courage to trust you in the seasons of life where we don't see you showing up, but that we would trust to know that your providence is still at work and your providence is a beautiful thing. May this give us a lightness and a hope in our present season. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.
Thanks so much for being here today for Church Online. If you would like to begin financially supporting Hope Church and our mission, it's easy to do. Text any dollar amount to the number that's on the screen, or you can click the link in the chat and follow the prompts to give that way. Just a reminder that right now we're conducting a drive for the Bethany Recovery Center. We want to partner with this new organization in our community to help women break free from addiction, especially women of young children. So we're going to help supply them and resource them to get them up and running. So if you have any baby supplies, diapers, uh, car seats, things like that, almost anything for a baby, Drop them off at the locations that we have throughout Lake Country. We're going to deliver those on December 17th. Click the link in the chat for more information on how you can do that. Finally, Christmas in Lake Country is going to be an online event this year, and that's going to allow us to do some new and exciting things. But part of the experience involves a Christmas in Lake Country experience kit. So make sure you order your kit. It's going to help you bring the church into your home for our Christmas experience this year, and we'll get that to you. And I'm looking forward to seeing you at Christmas in Lake Country. Make sure you invite a friend. It's never been easier to invite a friend to Christmas. That's all for today. We'll see you next week for part three of A Christmas Story.